Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us. So my name is Eni Perez. I am one of the co-chairs of the RFS GIGU Repro Service Line for the year 2020. And uh, first and foremost, thank you for everybody uh, for joining us tonight who are coming, uh, who are listening to us live, but then also thank you if you are watching this through YouTube later on. Uh, but also, most importantly, I want to thank Dr. Crady for uh, taking the time to present to us. And uh, today, um, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Crady, uh, who will be sharing with us a, a summary of the recently published uh, FEM study and then her accompanying uh, commentary published in uh, JVIR. So a little bit of background on Dr. Crady. She is an associate professor in the Division Director of Vascular Interventional, Interventional Radiology at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Uh, after attending the University of Florida for medical school and radiology residency, Dr. Crady completed a fellowship in vascular and interventional radiology at the University of Pennsylvania. The first seven years of her career was spent at Georgetown in Washington, D.C. before joining the faculty at UAB. So she currently serves as the Division Director of Interventional Radiology, but also Vice Chair of Interventional Affairs in the Department of Radiology at UAB. Dr. Crady is an active member of the Society of Interventional Radiology and presently serving as Vice Chair of the SIR Foundation Board of Directors. After her term is complete, she will serve as a graduate role, uh, a graduated role as a chair of the foundation board of directors to follow. In addition, she holds the title of co-chair of the Women's Health Service Line, the SIR. Dr. Carady is also an active uh, editorial board member and reviewer for the premier medical journals within her specialty. So, which is I. <laughs> Special interests of Dr. Grady include treatment of uterine fibroids uh, and other uterine conditions, pelvic venous congestions, varicoceles, prostates, hyperplasia, uh, kidney cancer, and pulmonary AVMs. She is a national and international lecturer, uh, teacher, and active publisher on research, research related to these topics. Uh, she, her, Dr. Grady's care includes a full spectrum of IR along with her team, she strives to provide treatments for her patients in the, same, in the same manner that she would for her own family. And so before I hand things over to Dr. Crady, I do want to welcome every, uh, again, thank you everybody for uh, joining us, but also welcome you to submit any questions uh, that you have in the question box and I can uh, gather them and then uh, present them to Dr. Crady at the end of the presentation. And so without further ado, uh, Dr. Crady, thank you for joining us. Wow, thank you so much for such a warm introduction and um, thank you to the RFS for the invitation. I'm honored to be able to talk to you tonight about the FEM trial, um, which compared myomectomy and uterine fibroid embolization. Um, this is an area of uh, immense interest to me, but I'm certainly by no means uh, the country or world expert in this. Um, I have had uh, so many mentors um, that actually are and, and that I've learned from and so I feel um, prepared to talk to you about this tonight, but also um, just excited about uh, the interest uh, in those of us, who, those of you who are joining me to um, learn about it. Uh, so uh, these are my disclosures. I'm not going to talk about any products tonight at all, um, so nothing relevant to the discussion. And um, specifically, uh, you know, I'd like to start by reviewing um, not only a little bit about fibroids, but also about uterine sparing techniques for fibroid treatment. So we all sort of start at the same baseline. And then we'll dissect some of the FEM trial data and then also um, discuss the points that were brought up in the um, subsequent commentaries and correspondence related to uh, the publication. So as you all know, fibroids are also called leiomyoma. They're the most common pelvic tumor in women. About 70% of Caucasian women and 80% of African-American women are affected by age 50. Now only about half of those um, women are actually symptomatic. Uh, uterine fibroids remain the most common indication for hysterectomy in the United States. So when we think about procedural management of fibroids, um, once we've sort of progressed past medical management and patients are considering some type of procedure for their symptoms, we are, we're mostly in two categories, and those are surgical treatments or uterine artery embolization. Now within the surgical treatment spectrum, we can consider hysterectomy or myomectomy. So hysterectomy, everyone knows, is removal of the uterus, whether with ovaries being spared or without. And myomectomy is individual removal of fibroids, whether singular or multiple all at once. Uterine artery embolization, um, we'll talk about a little bit in a moment, but what's unique about uterine artery embolization is that not only is it uterine sparing, but it is a global treatment of fibroids similar in a sense to a hysterectomy, 
um, although uh, a woman gets to maintain her uterus. Now, there have been several randomized controlled trials that have compared surgical treatments and uterine artery embolization. And in fact, greater than 8,000 women have been enrolled in these randomized controlled trials. However, the vast majority of these women have undergone a hysterectomy within these trials, and only a few hundred women in the, have actually been in the myomectomy arm of any of these trials combined. And what's important is that what we're going to discuss tonight is a trial that actually looked at uterine artery embolization and compared it to myomectomy. And the reason why this is important, it's sort of comparing apple, apples to apples to quote uh, Dr. Stewart, who wrote one of the commentaries in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the sense that these are both uterine sparing techniques, so actually um, it seems much more reasonable to actually compare these modalities. When we're talking about uterine sparing fibroid treatments, from a patient perspective, there's a couple of factors that interest a woman in um, pursuing a, a, a uterine sparing technique. And so I want to bring these to light so that at the end of our discussion, we can see how both UAE and myomectomy fare in these regards. So one of those is, uh, you know, most women who come and are exploring a uterine sparing technique are looking for a shorter recovery time. They're either at the working age or still um, taking care of children at home. And so they're looking for something that has a short recovery period. The other um, category that women often come and discuss in terms of uterine sparing techniques is that they wanna maintain their fertility. So again, we'll circle back to these towards the end of the discussion and see how we fare in each group. When we're talking about um, a uterine artery embolization or a myomectomy, we have to talk about the location of fibroids. And there's really three main locations of fibroids. Those are submucosal, which can include both the intercavitary types and the submucosal that are bulging into the, the cavity or bulging into the endometrium. But either way, there's all submucosal. Then we have our intramural fibroids in the musculature of the uterus. And then we have those on the outside of the uterus, which are the subserosal type. So there's a whole discussion. We could spend an entire hour talking about why it's important from a uterine artery standpoint, um, uterine artery embolization standpoint in terms of safety and what types of fibroids we treat. But in this regard, what I really want to talk about is that these locations are also impact how a myomectomy is performed. And so there are several different types of myomectomy. At most institutions, whether academic or private practice, there are three types that are really um, typical in most practices, and those are hysteroscopic, open abdominal, and laparoscopic. Now, the robotic type um, are usually very specific to um, particular institutions and a bit of a more high-level um, myomectomy technique. Laparoscopic, most people are familiar with because it's um, utilized in many different types of surgeries, and so it involves abdominal incisions, but they're small, sizable, just for the ports that they um, that go through those areas. And then uh, you can imagine that the fibroids that are treated via this route have to be of a certain size as well. Open abdominal is exactly what is, is said by the name, and so it requires a larger abdominal incision and is uh, utilized in patients who have really bulky fibroid disease or other um, comorbidities that require this type of operation. And then finally, hysteroscopic myomectomy um, is really utilized for patients who have fibroids in the submucosal region that can be targeted via a scope that uh, goes vaginally and transcervically and um, can be targeted in that manner. Now, even um, submucosal fibroids that are accessible in that region uh, sometimes it cannot be treated hysteroscopically because of their size limitations. And most gynecologists uh, start to get uncomfortable with fibroids that are greater than four or five centimeters in size in the submucosal region and won't consider a hysteroscopic approach um, for sizable fibroids greater than that. In regard to uterine fibroid embolization, um, this procedure was developed in the 1990s and now we have well over two decades of support in the literature. This uh, literature has shown that it's effective in approximately 90% of women, and it is in the current ACOG guidelines as an option for women who wish to maintain their uteri. How do we perform this procedure? This is a very simplistic um, picture, but basically we target a superficial vessel, whether the femoral artery or the radial artery for access. We travel with our catheter and target the uterine arteries or the collateral arteries that supply the fibroids and deliver some type of embolic to those to starve the fibroid of its nutrients and oxygen, which causes fibroid infarction. In this graphic, which is a bit older, um, there's 
there is utilization of PVA, which is still sometimes utilized. However, microspheres have kind of taken over. And then also um, in some countries, even gel film is used. But in any case, it's an embolic um, uh, bead type substance or particulate because this is a tumoral embolization. What we expect in terms of imaging and why I bring this up because we'll talk a little bit about why MRI is important in regard to this study and was potentially underutilized. Um, but MRI is important both pre and post procedure to most interventional radiologists who perform uterine fibroid embolization um, because it allows us to look at first, you know, are these fibroids appropriate for treatment? So you'll see on the left sided image on the screen, this is a post contrast sagittal image and you see the fibroid is largely distorting the uterus and the endometrial canal and is uh, as enhanced as the rest of the uh, uterine tissue. That's important because uh, part of in targeting a fibroid, we need to know that there's contrast enhancement. Also, in targeting of the, the fibroids, um, it's nice to know if there's a concurrent uh, uterine condition such as adenomyosis because we may change our technique. The middle image is what it looks like when we're actually embolizing. And this particular image was a bilateral access so that you can see the entire fibroid enhancing at once. You can even see the smaller fibroid on the inferior aspect of that image. And then finally, in the post UAE um, MRI, you can see complete fibroid infarction, which is our goal um, to reduce reintervention for recurrent symptoms. You can also see that there's a volume reduction of the fibroids as well as overall uterine volume reduction. So let's turn and talk about the FEM trial. So FEM uh, actually stands for fibroids with embolization or myomectomy to measure the effect on quality of life. It was a multi-centered randomized control trial. Now it wasn't blinded, as you can imagine, it's very difficult to blind a patient to whether they're having a uterine fibroid embolization or a surgical procedure um, like a myomectomy where they're going to undergo general anesthesia. So um, the trial was not blinded for that reason. The primary outcome was the uterine fibroid symptom quality of life questionnaire and score. And the study was carried out for two years. Now the results were published in July of 2020, which was concurrent with um, Fibroid Awareness Month. And um, it, they were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. To follow that and actually simultaneous to it, there, were, there was kind of a media uh, flurry and um, editorial that came um, simultaneous to the publication, as well as um, interventional news article, which is what you see down in the lower left. And then um, even as recent as November, the New England Journal of Medicine published multiple comments to the editor and then a response from the authors of the um, publication. As was mentioned at the beginning of the talk and during the introduction, uh, some I also participated in, in a commentary that was uh, published by JVIR, um, that I don't have up here on the screen, but we'll discuss some of the points that were brought up in that as well. So we'll start by talking about the methodology and we'll just briefly touch on this. I hope, um, you know, we'll keep at all of these sections a bit on the short side so that we can save time for um, discussion at the end. But in regard to treatment allocation, you can see that for the UAE and myomectomy groups, both groups were initially uh, a one-to-one -one randomization with 127 participants in each group. Now, if you go down to the bottom of this chart and look at the, the bottom row, you can see that there were a fair number of patients within the UAE group that actually underwent myomectomy from the start, so 11%. Similarly, if you look in the allocated myomectomy group, you can go down to the bottom row and see that uh, there were several patients, 7% in fact, that underwent hysterectomy from the start. So it's something to pay attention to because these patients this wasn't about a re-intervention. This was actually that these patients went on to hysterectomy despite their allocation from the start, meaning that the overall outcomes that are assessed and the data that is um, gathered about these patients is really um, reflective of their actual procedure that they have being a hysterectomy, which may you know, sway the results some. Because a patient who undergoes a myomectomy, which preserves the uterus, versus a hysterectomy, where the whole uh, problem being the symptomatic fibroids are removed entirely, could definitely sway the data. You can see that the patients in the UAE group, there were none that underwent a hysterectomy from the start. When we look at the results in terms of procedural details, I'll draw your attention to three specific areas. And so um, in regard to length of hospital stay, which um, is presented in median days to discharge, uterine artery embolization fared better at two days 
and this was statistically significant as compared to myomectomy, which was four days. Let's also talk about the infarction rate in terms of fibroid infarction. And you can see um, in that second blue uh, rectangle, I've highlighted the infarction rates there. The complete infarction rate in the UAE group was 40%. The near complete infarction rate was 33%. And finally, the incomplete infarction rate was close to 30% as well. Now, typically, if you review uh, previous trials that have uh, looked at symptomatic uterine fibroids and uterine artery embolization, the complete infarction rate combined with the near complete infarction rate has are patients who showed the best results. And that means that greater than 90% of their fibroid volume or their fibroid burden is infarcted. Now, those patients in, in prior studies typically are greater, make up greater than 80% of the patient population. And you can see here, even if you combine these two groups, we're in the low 70%. So there has been some uh, concern about uh, that percentile or that percentage and whether it really reflects good embolization technique. We'll talk about that a little bit in the, in, uh, later in the talk. W with regard to myomectomy, um, there's some percentages listed here for the types of myomectomy that were performed. And if you look, the laparoscopic and hystero hysteroscopic myomectomy percentages are actually quite low. And the open abdominal um, type of myomectomy is 82% of the patient population within the myomectomy group. This is unusually high for um, any practice. Now, there's also a list of conversions to open abdominal uh, myomectomies. You can see that um, the, a laparoscopic conversion to open abdominal um, myomectomy took place in 1% of the population and hysteroscopic conversion to open abdominal took place in 6% of the population. Now, really for the, one of the most important slides, we're gonna talk about the quality of life scores. And um, you know, this being the primary outcome of the FEM trial, I wanna highlight it certainly and talk about and dissect it and talk about what um, uh, the take home points here. So if you look, let's actually start by looking at the graph on the right. Now the blue line represents the myomectomy group and the red line represents the uterine artery embolization group. I've highlighted that at baseline, you can see the blue line starts off lower. So these scores um, are actually considered better as they go higher. So the baseline score for the myomectomy group was lower, meaning these patients were, were more um, unhappy with their quality of life and more symptomatic from their fibroids. Now, if we also go to the right side of the graph, we're at the two-year mark, you can see that the myomectomy group fared better in terms of a higher score, but that the confidence intervals between the UAE group and the myomectomy group do overlap. Now, I've also highlighted in the oval in the middle of the, that graph that the, the actual primary outcome that was planned for in this trial was to look at the difference, the mean difference in scores, so meaning the difference from baseline to the endpoint. And when you look at that, the difference between these two groups ended up being eight points. So, of course, that is affected by the fact that the myomectomy group started at a lower baseline. Um, now, if we look at the left-sided uh, table, I'll draw your attention to the bottom numbers. And these are the absolute um, scores at the two-year point. So the uterine artery embolization score ended up with um, 80 on the dot. The myomectomy score was at 84.6. Now these were actually um, statistically significant, but the question becomes, are they clinically significant on a 100-point scale? Now let's look at results in terms of pregnancy outcomes. So this is one of those factors that we talked about would be so important potentially to a woman who's considering a uterine sparing technique. Women reporting pregnancy during the trial in the UAE group comprised 8% of that population and only 4% of the myomectomy population. Looking at it in a different way, if you just look at the women who actually desired pregnancy at the time of randomization, 17% um, of the UAE population achieved pregnancy and 10% of the myomectomy population desiring pregnancy were able to achieve it. But again, what looks like uh, better numbers for uterine artery embolization, although not statistically significant. Now we're gonna talk about complications and I'll show this in two different ways. So first we're gonna talk about the intention to treat analysis. And so when you look at complications in that regard, 
um, actually the uterine artery embolization and myomectomy groups were similar across the board with whether it be perioperative complications or post-discharge complications. And I know that I'm showing this quickly, but I'm just summarizing it for you. So they, they, they fared similarly in, this, in these regards when you're looking from an intention to treat analysis. Now, when we look at it at complications from a per protocol perspective, meaning those patients who underwent, actually underwent a uterine artery embolization, those complications are listed in the uterine artery embolization group. And those patients who actually underwent a myomectomy, the, their complications are listed under the myomectomy group. So completely different than an intention to, to treat a, uh, analysis. So if we look at that, I'll draw your attention to the blood transfusion rate, which was zero as expected for uterine artery embolization and 10% in the myomectomy group. When we look at reinterventions, uh, in the uterine artery embolization group, there were 16% of uh, our reintervention rate in the two-year period and only 7% in the myomectomy group, and this was statistically significant. So let's start to summarize some of these similarities between the UAE group and myomectomy group, and then we'll also talk about some of the differences. Some of these I've highlighted in tables and graphs for you, and others I'm just going to present in this list form because the graphs or the tables that were that corresponded to them were just too complex to really show in this format. So menstrual bleeding scores were similar amongst the myomectomy and UAE groups. The percentage of patients who would actually recommend their procedure to a friend were similar. The pregnancy rates, as we showed, although potentially underpowered, were similar. The biomarkers of, of, of ovarian reserve were not different and not affected by either UAE or myomectomy. And then the perioperative and postoperative complication rates, as we showed, if we're looking at an intention to treat analysis, were not significantly different. Now, if we consider some of the differences in the results between groups, the primary outcome favored myomectomy, as we talked about, in terms of the quality of life score. The reintervention rate favored myomectomy. The shorter hospital stays favored UAE. And certainly the need for blood transfusions favored UAE if you're looking at a per protocol analysis rather than an intention to treat analysis. So when we discuss this trial, I think there are some obvious strengths. Some of those include that this trial compared myomectomy to UAE, and trials previously had a very low number of participants in the myomectomy arms. So this is a win. It also, uh, the authors were also able to um, approach this in a multidisciplinary team of investigators. There, were, there was a high proportion of black women and, lar and also with large fiber and uteri, which is representative of the actual patient population who's afflicted by this disease and the way that we see these patients present. And it included women who wish to become pregnant, which is unusual for most fibroid trials. They are usually not considered and are screened out of previous trials regarding symptomatic fibroids. But there are also some limitations to this trial, which we've touched upon some of these, and we'll talk about a little bit more. There were baseline differences in the health-related quality of life, which made the primary outcome, which was, uh, you know, the difference, the mean difference in these uh, UFS quality of life scores, um, certainly uh, affects that overall primary outcome. There were too few pregnancies to really be powered to assess effects on fertility. MRI was um, obtained in only 70% of the patients who actually underwent a UAE. So as we talked about before, patients who may have a concomitant disease process such as adenomyosis um, may not be identified on ultrasound. And those uh, patients, especially with uh, adenomyosis, for instance, may undergo a different protocol for their uterine artery embolization, starting with a smaller embolic, for instance. So these patients may be undertreated. Only 73% of the women undergoing UAE had that um, greater than 90% infarction of fibroids, so fell into either the near complete or complete fibroid infarction. And this is unusually low for most fibroid trials in, in regard to uterine artery embolization and fibroid infarction. And this begs the question, what was the embolic type that was utilized in this trial? And, and also, what was the endpoint for embolization? 
And one of the criticisms in most of the commentaries is that the embolic type and, and the details of embolization were not at all presented. So I want to circle back to those questions that we asked at the beginning. You know, patients who are go, undergoing a, or looking into a uterine sparing fibroid treatment have some interest in both shorter recovery times and maintenance of fertility. So how did our groups fare? Well, shorter recovery times certainly favored UAE. In regard to maintenance of fertility, although underpowered, there was no difference in either the pregnancy rates or uh, the ovarian reserve, which was not affected, not shown to be affected in either the myomectomy or the UAE groups. There are other factors that I think are worth mentioning um, that were uh, interesting in the FEM trial, and those included the open abdominal myomectomy rate of 82%. You know, most women who are looking for a uterine sparing uh, procedure are not um, in an ideal world seeking out something that requires a large abdominal incision. Also, uh, women who are seeking these types of treatments are typically um, expecting to go into the procedure and expecting to come out of the procedure with the with the procedure that was intended. However, there were con conversions both in to from myomectomy to hysterectomy, and also conversions of what is expected to be a minimally invasive myomectomy by hysteroscopic technique, all the way to conversion to open myomectomy in six percent of patients. While only one patient underwent a uh, planned uh, myomectomy, which was converted to a hysterectomy. Um, you can imagine being that one patient and going into the procedure expecting to come out with a uterus and not having one on the way out. So although it seems insignificant to only be one patient, I think it is actually quite significant. And these factors, um, you know, not only add to a patient's um, physical concerns, but also in recovery times, but also can be um, um, have psychiatric concerns for women who have certain expectations going into a procedure. This was not experienced in the uterine artery embolization group. Now, patients in the uterine, uterine artery embolization group do undergo, um, in this trial, increased secondary interventions, but they're more of a planned procedure due to recurrence of symptoms. So in summary, uh, what are some take-home points that I'd like to leave with you? I think um, the quality of life scores, although they were statistically significant, most people believe that on a 100 point quality of life scale, that they're not clinically significant when the difference is 84 to 80 points. The need for transfusion was certainly more prevalent in the myomectomy, myomectomy group and was a non-factor in the UAE group. The potential conversions that um, during the procedure are certainly more likely in the myomectomy group and did not occur in the uterine artery embolization group. The pregnancy rates were underpowered, but not different. The ov ovarian reserve was not affected in either group. And finally, I would say that myomectomy and UAE, based on this trial and others, are more alike than they are different. And ultimately, it's really about the patient understanding the advantages and disadvantages of both procedures. And this trial has helped us to do that. So overall, even though there's a perspective by some interventional radiologists that this was a negative um, trial, I think it is just the conclusion um, that was reached that can be presented in, in, at times as a negative finding. But in reality, this trial helped us to uncover and to further um, emphasize some of the things that we already know about uterine artery embolization and myomectomy in that they are both quite effective for the treatment of symptomatic fibroids. Thank you so much again for having me. I am uh, honored to have the invitation and look forward to some of the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Grady. So we have gotten a question from the audience. Um, Dr. Boone, I hope I said that right, uh, is joining us tonight. So she has a question. Um, there has been some discussion about the appropriateness of intention to treat analysis for surgical procedural clinical trials. As this, uh, as the, then this study, as in this study, uh, her pr protocol and intention to treat analysis yielded different findings with respect to the complication rates. Do you think this study would have benefited from emphasizing the per protocol analysis or reporting and discussing both analysis? Going forward, would it be better to consider alternatives to intention to treat analysis? Uh, 
Yeah, that's a great question. And I think we touched upon this, but I'll um, sort of re-emphasize. So in the actual publication, um, they the table, I believe, that was shown in regard to complications was the intention to treat analysis. Now, if you look in the supplementary material, they did present the table um, that includes the per protocol analysis. And so I think it was there, but with some digging. And, um, you know, the authors um, in response, and if I'm not mistaken, I think Dr. Boone might have been one of the authors of one of the commentaries, but um, the authors of the FEM trial um, have commented that it is uh, well known that the appropriate way to report outcomes is in, in an intention to treat analysis. Um, however, I do think that you bring up a fair point that, and, and I think we discussed during, um, during this presentation, that both should be presented. Um, and you know, perhaps that it would have been uh, more ideal if the per protocol analysis was also presented in the main article publication and not just in the supplementary material. Okay, uh, I actually have a question. So I, I did a little bit of reading on some of the previous literature that you um, published, particularly in endovascular um, today, about a year ago or so, talking about the reimbursement uh, landscape for uterine fibroid embolization. Um, and you talked a little bit about how some of the difficulties that physicians sometimes have where they have to do potentially a peer-to-peer -peer, um, with an insurance company to get UFI approved. How would you say that the FEM trial um, kind of impacts those discussions and how would they potentially utilize the FEM trial um, in order to be an advocate for the patient? Yeah, I actually think that, that it supports it. You know, the more data we have in the randomized control trial format that shows how efficacious um, uterine fibroid embolization is in um, improving a patient's quality of life, um, I think is, is, a, is a bonus. And, um, on top of that, um, you know, looking at the median day, hospital days, certainly um, insurance companies are, you know, looking from a payment standpoint and looking at um, similar techniques in terms of being uterine preserving, um, but comparing them in terms of how long the patient is, uh, you know, in the hospital, it's certainly more expensive, um, one would think, to keep a patient in the hospital longer. Now, you know, that deserves its own analysis. but. Um, the point being on the surface level anyway, it would seem very appealing uh, to an insurance company to support this technique. And so I think overall, um, the data that has been acquired um, as a result of the FEM trial is a bonus for us. Okay. Um, if anybody else would like to ask a question, um, feel free. And I guess kind of going off of that, I do have a different question. Um, just recently on Twitter, I saw Dr. Pereira um, publish a, a how-to guide on a super, uh, superior, uh, excuse me, um, a superior hypogastric nerve block. Um, what is your typical, and kind of, and he was um, kind of arguing that, you know, he was having to argue with his patient because she wanted to leave before like noon or so. Um, and so given the benefit of the procedure, and so what is your typical practice? Um, do you typically keep uh, uh, patients overnight or, or have you developed kind of um, using a superior hypogastric nerve block or some kind of uh, different method to be able to have same day discharge on these patients? Yeah, another good question. So I'll, I'll give you a, uh, hopefully not too long winded of an answer, but um, as a, in the transition, I've just recently transitioned institutions and the, the protocol has been quite different between those two. So um, I'm familiar with a lot of different ways of doing this. I would say um, at my prior institution, we were still in the habit of keeping patients for 23 observation. Now, most people are moving away from that and they're doing so um, with a variety of different, um, I guess, tools, uh, one of which is the superior hypogastric nerve block. Now, where I am currently, um, we are not keeping patients overnight, but we're also not utilizing a superior hypogastric nerve block in most patients. I think it's um, been shown to be very effective. There's um, some really big proponents of it, and it's certainly um, a good tool to have in the toolbox. Um, some of us feel that it's a secondary procedure and either that it's time consuming, which is not the main issue. Most people feel that there are some complications secondary to it um, that are sometimes unpreventable. And, um, you know, when you're taking an outpatient healthy elective population and um, adding a, a potential additional complication, um, it can be found upon. And so 
Um, some of us uh, feel a little less comfortable for that reason. I think it is a great technique, and I do think patients who undergo it appreciate it from a pain stamp control standpoint. Um, what we're doing is, um, you know, some people utilize transradial technique to sort of minimize a patient's time having to lie flat and potentially creating more issues with nausea. Um, some people are just utilizing um, setting expectations well in combination with using intraarterial lidocaine at the um, uh, uh, end of embolization, which is what I do, and then um, targeting, um, you know, the inflammatory reaction that takes place from fibroid embolization by starting um, toward all beforehand and then also utilizing it afterwards. So there's a variety of different ways to do it, um, all of which are, you know, as you said, discussed um, on social media, but also um, in some of the conferences and where we get to talk about um, pain and protocols post-procedure. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Grady. Um, again, once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for giving us a little bit of time and talking us through the study, but also thank you for everybody uh, who came out tonight. Uh, I definitely am a little bit more excited to learn more. And so I um, hope everybody has a good night and uh, stay warm. Thank you so much. Take care. Good night. Take care.